Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the new group off stage in our conversation series, uh, Why We Do It, where every week I get to talk to a friend who's been an integral part of the company about, you know, past, future, and present things at this crazy moment in time. Uh, anyway, thanks for joining. Uh, just a couple of little housekeeping things that we have to do tomorrow. Big night, we have our reunion reading of Jesse Eisenberg's play, The Spoils, with uh, Jesse Eisenberg and Kunal Nayar and Aaron Dark and, oh, there they are, Michael Zegan and Annapurna Shriram and, uh, and Jesse. Uh, anyway, I suggest you tune in. The rehearsal was fantastic and fun and what a great group of people. It was such amazing production and, you know, it comes through in our, uh, uh, when they're reading it online, you really can feel the play and uh, the performances are amazing. So you got to come to that. And each one of these reunion reading series, we pair with a local initiative that's working to support New Yorkers. And for the spoils, uh, we are partnering with the C Lighting Foundation's fundraiser for immigrant theater artists financially impacted by COVID-19. The C Lighting Foundation aims to distribute $500 monthly grants to 60 immigrant artists registered with the foundation. 10% of your ticket spoil, tickets to the spoils will directly benefit their fundraisers. So get your tickets at thenewgroup.org and go on their website if you want and see what they're all about. It's an amazing organization founded by one of my favorite young lighting designers. Uh, she did uh, Danye Love's play with us last season, one and two, and she's amazing. And she started this very early on and seems to be taking off and I'm excited for her and what she's doing. Uh, okay, so uh, next up, Malik Pancholi. He's here in the house. Malik, I you look like we're sort of in the same place. Like our our th our backgrounds match. We have the same. Actually. It seems like. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny. Uh, how you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. How are you? Yeah, I'm hanging in there. You know, that, uh, that doing, doing doing the COVID the COVID artist thing. Yeah, yeah. What is what is strange and um, bizarre time we are in. I know. Yeah. I know. But in a way, like I've accept, I've gone through a lot of stages, like the uh, you know the tubular Ross stages, and I've gone to the acceptance phase where I've, uh, you know, I sort of accepted it and I'm, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing some fun things and trying to fill the day with some, you know, connecting with artists and trying to figure out some things and including you. Uh, so tell, what are you doing? Me out is like a full-time job, Scott. Good luck. What is? <laughs> trying to figure me out is going to be a full-time <laughs> I thought you said working out is a full-time job. You must be pretty fit. That's it. Uh, <laughs> have you been working out a lot? <laughs> uh, you know, I've been doing a lot. I've been doing a lot of home yoga. Uh, oh yeah, like, you've been doing that online yoga stuff. Yeah, like I, I got a little account on one of those online like streaming things where you pay like twenty dollars a month and you can pick mm -hmm. your pick of yoga instructors. And I maybe default sadly to the ones that are appealing to look at, but you know, it makes the day go by. <laughs> yeah, totally. You got to go with the the one the yoga teacher you're attracted to. That's half of it. Um, but uh, no, I like. Uh, I love yoga. I do yoga all the time, but um, but I haven't been able to get into the online on the, into the online version. I do hot yoga, and wow. so uh, you know Bikram yoga, and so yeah, it's been you can't really. It's weird, you know, to try to do it without the heat part of it. Yeah, yeah, and you certainly don't want to heat up your whole house. Although it's hot enough now that you could probably just go do yoga outside, and it would be. I have a friend who's doing that. I have also a friend who like heated his bedroom up to like 90 <laughs> degrees and did it in the bedroom. Anyway, enough about our 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 physiques. Yeah, you look like, amazing. You look amazing. <laughs> you look amazing, you know, considering, you know, we haven't seen each other in person in a really long time. Let's talk about, you know, I'm so curious, about, you know, because of, of course the COVID moment, like when everything hit, weren't you in a Broadway show at that moment? I was, I was. I was doing... Um, Grand Horizons uh, at the Helen Hayes Theater. And you you know, it was so interesting, Scott, because it was like the last week of performances, we'd, we'd look out and you'd see a few people in masks. Like it was just starting. Um, but there we were in a theater with the Helen Hayes, it's like the smallest Broadway theater, but there were, there were you know, 600 people in the audience and uh, seven of us on stage. And we were all kind of like, what is this gonna be? And then I remember when it closed, I went to go see, and we closed on time. We got like so lucky, we closed. Oh, as you're lucky. I think we might've been like the last 
Broadway show to actually not be forced to, to close, which was such mm. a gift. But I went to go see both parts of The Inheritance that week in like a theater with a thousand people or whatever. And I remember like the lines to the men's room were so long, um, which they never are. And not because people had to go to the bathroom, but people were like spending 20 seconds washing their hands. And so it took forever to get through the bathroom line. And then I flew to LA for the premiere of uh, a Disney Junior cartoon I do called Mira Royal Detective and was on a plane. And it was like the world was beginning to shut down. You know, it was like on the plane, I was kind of, like, kind of embarrassed, but I, I cleaned my seat with Lysol wipes. And, and then by the time I got back, which I think was like March 5th or 6th, it was, you know, the world was, the world was done, so. Yeah, it just that sort of happened overnight, didn't it? Yeah, it feels like it. I remember I, I got off the plane from LA and I had a panic attack and I was like, I need to go get um, hand sanitizer and toilet paper, which of course everybody <laughs> was getting. That was a crazy moment. And I couldn't, I went to four drugstores in our neighborhood and there was no, no hand sanitizer <laughs> and no toilet paper. And that, this is, I don't know if this is appropriate for this audience, but I was like, what if I have a temperature? Because I'd been on an airplane, I'd been in LA and I started the panic and I could, and in four drugstores, there was one thermometer <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna be I'm gonna be embarrassed to say this out loud. It was a baby rectal thermometer, <laughs> and I bought it. <laughs> yeah, you got to do what you got to do, Molly. You got to do what you got to do. That is so amazing. What a great story. I know, like during that moment that when everybody was buying up things. Yeah, my boyfriend texted me like a a picture. He found some bounty paper towels. It was like he found the gold. Yeah. 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 Well, the first time back to the grocery store, we found um, disinfectant spray and there was one left on like an empty shelf. And I remember I was like looking around, I was like, am, am I allowed, like, can I take this? <laughs> and I bought it. <laughs> you won the prize. They saw you coming down the aisle and they recognized you from weeds. <laughs> <laughs> and they put it on that. <laughs> oh, Malik, that is so funny. I'm so happy to talk to you. You know, I found these, I find these conversations restorative in a way because, uh, you know, it's fun to sort of connect with somebody that you have a history with. You know, uh, I feel like I've watched you grow up in a strange way. Oh my God. Uh, well, you cast me in my first- uh, That was your first show, right? Playing New York, yeah, Aunt Anna Lemon, yeah. And I remember, because it was always so funny, because we used to always, Wally Shawn's play, Aunt Anna and Lemon, which was, was so great. I love that show. Uh, and Molly had a very little part, <laughs> but you, you sort of stole your scene. You know, that was what everybody always said. I know, it was amazing. It was so evident. And and how did you come to that? Didn't you like meet Wally on a plane or something? Or Oh my God, I can't. I Wally like, and, and you met, you were like in Yale or you were out of Yale or, or something. Because of course you went to Yale, right? It was yeah. before that, it was like, um, but by the way, I think I, I think I just came to like an audition for that, but I had met Wally uh, at an airport, but it, it was like even before grad school, I think I was, right out of undergrad or maybe even in undergrad. And it was so classic, like Wallace Shawn, like he he was there, he had like a bag full of like a hundred New York Times or something. <laughs> he was literally just like reading a, a million newspapers. And I, you know, like like everybody else, I was such a huge fan of his uncle Vanya. And, uh, and so I went up to him and that's, you know, like nerdy drama school thing. And I was like, I just want to say like that, that movie, uh, Vanya on 42nd Street, changed my whole life, you know, all those things that you say when you're, you know, 19 or 20 or however old I was at the time. And he was so kind and we had a whole conversation about it. And then I, I don't I actually don't think that I brought it up to him in the rehearsal room until much later because I was so embarrassed. <laughs> no, I think he remembered that because I think he told me about it. I think I heard the story from him and oh. not from you. Well, that makes I sort of remember him saying, I'm like, you know, I connected you with the plane and the, and then he, maybe it was after you auditioned and he remembered you or I don't know, but he, he definitely remembered you. Well, you're well, memorable, obviously. Good. Like note to young actors out there, don't be afraid to go. <laughs> pester or not, pester a famous actor. You're asking for trouble. Now they're all going to be harassing you if, if you ever go to an airport again. Uh, <laughs> you're going to be harassed. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's so funny. That, um, it was so, it was so, um, first of all, everybody in that show like went on to have these, I mean, already had amazing careers, but went on to have these amazing careers like Marsha Stephanie Blake. And, oh, yeah. 
I just ran into Liam, whose last name I'm like blanking on. At the Liam moment. Craig. Liam Craig. Yeah, well, I worked with him even before that. I knew Liam a really long time. I lost touch with him, but he was always a great actor. Su such a great actor. And Carlos Leone and I, we used to take the train home together at night. It was like such an unlikely yeah. friendship. Yeah. And we became such good friends and it, it was such a fun time. That was a fun time. It was a great, that was a great company. Melissa Errico. Melissa Errico, Kristen Johnson. Melissa, Kristen Johnson, Lily Taylor, the great Lily Taylor. Great performance, uh, great performance. Wow. Uh, hard, hard play, but we found it. That was like the fun of it. Like what, like, so you work on something and then you find it. Do you know, I think we had that experience on Good for Auto as well, but like, even in like your work outside of like what I know of your work, the intimacies that we have, um, what, what's that process for you? Like, where, do, how do you get into a character and, and, and how do you find, you know, what you're looking for, even in like your TV stuff, which is always so memorable. I mean, your character on Weeds and of course, 30 Rock. I mean, it was comedy, but it well, also was so nuanced. So um, how do you, how do you what, what what's your how do you get where you're going? I mean, I know you went to Yale, but tell tell everybody all the actors out there who are interested. Yeah, I mean, this is this is like so oversimplifying, and I feel like I'm slightly embarrassed because I feel like you're going to be like Malik. After we have this talk, I'm going to give you a few pointers on how to really act. <laughs> <laughs> I've already done that, Malik. I know totally, but I but I you know like I feel like the basic thing for me is always that a character has. Um, you know, a self-perceived set of things that they feel that they're good at and a self-perceived set of weaknesses. Um, and that most characters are fighting to to prove themselves against those weaknesses, you know, to, to in terms of like that objective or what or what they're working towards. It's because they're trying to overcome something that they feel that they uh, are missing in their lives or are deficient about. And, you know, like with, you know, so with, with like 30 Rock, I feel like with Jonathan, it was so clear to me that he needed the validation of his boss and that Liz Lemon was uh, an obstacle to achieving that. So he had to like, every chance was like, gotta knock Liz Lemon out of the way so I can get there first, you know? And, and for that, to me, like that felt like such a, it was, and also, you know, the writing was so good in that, that it was so clear and easy uh, to find those moments and really like, le really lean into them. But, you know, I'd say, I think good for Otto. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because that was such a, um, such a lesson in playing a character who had, uh, a very different life experience than than I have had, you know, and I and also I think David Rabe is so brilliant, uh, but also in that play, I think that he had this vast world going on, but he left enough openings in it for all of us to have to fill in uh, fill in those spaces with things that felt personal to us. And so, you know, I remember reading so many great playwriting. That's what that's called. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like it's so clear who this person is, but there's so much stuff going on underneath it that that you can bring your own perspective and bring your own experience to. And um, I read I read so many books about uh, people who had experienced trauma as children and the kind of impact that that could have on their lives. And you know, hopefully, a number of people on this um, on this. Zoom streamyard streaming thing, whatever. However, people are watching this, uh, got to see the show. But you know that was, that was a character who had so many difficulties forming real relationships later in life. And and to me, the clues in the text were about um, having that taken away from him at an early age. Uh, and so that was to me that was a thing. Like he had this thing that was taken away from him, and so he was fighting to build that up in his real life. And because he was incapable of doing it. Uh, he had to pretend to the world that he actually was capable of doing something that he was completely, um, completely incapable of doing. And so, so that to me was like, was the connection. But I feel like the process that you are talking about, that process of discovering it and feeling like, oh, you landed on something. It, there were so many opportunities for that in that play because the scenes could really go in so many different directions. And so I feel like what you did, uh, which was so incredible, was you created space for us to find those moments with an incredibly talented cast. And because I feel like you had that space, uh, it felt slightly different every night, even though we were like kind of on, you know, like always on the same trajectory of the story we were telling, but there was, it just felt really alive every night. So that was, that was like a really special night to get to be it. Yeah, I loved watching that because it did, because it was so musical, the play in a weird way. And so the, it always felt different every night, like how, you know, you can, you know, you can play a note, but, 
it's the same note, but in some fraction of a way, it's different. Yeah. You know, well, and that's what I admire about you, actually, as an actor, and just sort of watching you from, and you've had this always. So, you know, it's just, you were just born with it, in my opinion. They didn't probably teach it to you at Yale. They probably just refined it. But you have an uncanny ability to just like, how you just told me a story about the inner life of your character. And, you know, and you have a way of sort of making it active. Because when I was listening to you, I thought, hmm, good direction. You know what I mean? And not my direction. I'm just saying the fact that you told yourself a, a, a you filled out your inner life in a way that seemed completely active. Oh, good. And I think, yeah. and I think that's what's so great about you know what you've done, and and you do you bring it to TV, but of course it's, it's so different TV scripts and like a David Ray play, you can't really compare them. And the writing's always good on TV, but you don't always have the opportunity to fill in as many as many uh, colors. When you're moving, you're moving so fast, so you kind of have to pick a color and 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 run with it. But I feel like you know in a theater rehearsal process where you have, well, I feel like did we have did we have a we had a pretty good amount of time in the rehearsal room on that. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, you know, you get to experiment a little bit more. And so, so you can kind of. No, I remember when I was thinking about our conversation today, I remembered all the, all the iterations of the character that you played, you know, and but until what you landed on, which I think is really so interesting. And of course we were in dialogue about it, but you know, I can only be your eyes. I can't be you, you know what I mean? And so do you remember any of that? Can you share a little bit about like what that process was like? That's sort of what I was getting at. Like you started one way, you became this, this, then that, and that, and all of a sudden you were the character. Yeah. Well, so 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 one thing that I remember really strongly was uh, so my character started off the second act with a monologue that was actually, I think, in the end, very very funny. Um, but in terms of the process of figuring it out, I feel like I had to connect it to. Uh, why he was trying to make the audience laugh so much. And that part of it felt so painful. And I remember there were early on ones where I was like, wow, this is definitely not right, <laughs> but it's so emotional. And so um, it felt so scary to even, to even do it. And I feel like out of that, like I was able to discover that like, oh, that's why he's making the audience laugh. Because if he actually talks about something that's like really real and true, it's so fucking, excuse me. So, so fucking- Okay, we're not on network television. <laughs> Thank you. Say whatever you want, but it's it's so scary, and and I and I also think like with a play like that, and Scott, I'm so curious what your process was like. With it was 14 of us, right? Like 14 actors who were all delving into really difficult subject matter, and so I remember like there were a few rehearsals where uh, it got really challenging because because I remember like I'd have a perspective on the character, and, and you would challenge it. But it was so I was so emotionally invested and, and felt so much of this guy <laughs> that I was like, well, I don't even know. You know, we're talking about like sexual abuse and like. And I remember at one point you were like, do you think there's any part of him? I, I hope it's okay that I say this out loud. But you're like, do you think there's any part of him that um, might have enjoyed it? And I was like, I'm so bad. No, but the thing was that, like, then as I got into it, I was like, oh, well, that's what happens when when you're young. It's so confusing because because sexuality can be can be exciting and dangerous and you can know it's wrong and you can also be confused about like why is this person sexualizing me and I just feel like that one little question even though I remember in the moment I was like that's insane but it opened up this whole world to me of um you know possibilities around why this character was so damaged from, from those from those experiences so yeah I remember that moment actually do you yeah. I, I do. Is that from you? Were you a little huh? like Malik? Were you a little like Malik? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I remember having like a really intense emotional. <laughs> I don't remember that, but I remember the conversation about it. Yeah, you know. Well, that's my. I do like like to. You know, it's important to explore all sides of things. Sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they don't help. But sometimes those questions help. You know, and in a way, you know, and you do this instinctively. And sometimes, sometimes, sometimes people need goading, but it's like making positive choices. It's that old thing, even in the, you know what I mean? That old thing sometimes really does make things come alive. You know, we tend to go to the, you know what I mean? Cause it feels good, you know, but if you yeah. get positive, if you take that positive thing, um, yeah, you did a lot of that in that show. 
And, uh, you know, like that was that, you, you know, that that was what I what I enjoyed about how you found that. I think a lot of people did in that show. You know, it's hard to play crazy people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's hard. It was a it was a it was a whole room full of uh, of uh, people with, uh, t you know, very difficult lives. <laughs> and, uh, you know. Well, and I, and I think that that's what you're saying. What, what you're saying is so right about um, characters are pursuing forward motion in their lives, you know, like they're, if, if they're in a bad situation, they're trying to get out of it. They might be interested in, in what that, in how that looks, but, but that's, you know, that's part of being. A well, I always look at it like, and you know, I've been labeled the, the Prince of Darkness in the past, but like, I always look at it like the human spirit is resilient. You know, like that's the thing. I mean, look at all of us now. Yeah. You yeah. know, like that's it. It's proof in a strange way. I know. Uh, I like the theater community has been so devastated by all of this, but then look at this amazing thing that you guys are doing with these conversations and the reading that's coming up and all the, all these, all these things that we are all doing to just, um, I would say like not only survive, but also continue to make art and continue to tell our stories and continue to have impact in the world. And, um, but that is, yeah, that's the resiliency I think of, of being human and being artists. Well, it's who we are. You, you're sort of born this way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Not, you know, <laughs> it is. It's, it yeah. definitely has that feeling, you know. Uh, you know, and I feel like, you know, we all, you know, what we're doing is making sure that everybody understands. And by going public with our experiments, and I mean, not just us at New Group, but sort of everywhere, is letting people know that theater artists are still thinking about the theater and, you know, getting ready for, you know, its return in some ways, you know, making sure that there's, there's, you know, movement, there's the, you know, the, um, uh, there, there's the race movement that's happening now. There's a lot of things that are happening that are sort of opening up, you know, people's thinking and scaring people and all those sorts of things. But no, but there is, I mean, there, it's, it's good to feel scared. Do you know what I mean? In a way, cause you, it, it forces you to sort of think about things It it, you know, um, yeah. So, I mean, I think like this time, is, is going to change all of us. And I'm excited to see like what, what new work comes out of that. Like, I, I think the new group has always pushed the envelope in terms of the plays and um, the plays that you guys do, but also uh, how you, how you program your seasons in terms of what is going on in the world period. And like, yeah. Yeah. I, I like to think we're engaged, <laughs> you know, in some way, or like, you know, in, in certain ways, you can't always be fully engaged, but, you know, we always work toward in, in some sort of engagement. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, we always are. And this moment is no different than any other moment in the sort of way that we're talking about things. You know, as you know, you're part of it, but we have a Napoleon group of artists always around us. And it's interesting, you know, seeing what people want to do and the stories that people want to tell and, it's certainly going to, you know, whatever we put out is certainly going to tell a, hopefully a story about this moment. Um, so, so what are you working on? Enough about me. Well, I, so I, you know, it's funny. I feel like when this hit, um, I actually feel like I got busier than I had been. And I mean, I was doing a Broadway play right when it, when it, when it hit, but suddenly like things really, really took off. So, so I'd say the primary thing in the first couple of months that I was working on was, from 2014 to 2017, I served on a commission at the White House under President Obama. Uh, I was a presidential appointee on a commission uh, on Asian Americans. It was called the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And I remember that very well because I remember seeing it and being like, I know, Molly. Oh, uh, yay. Yeah, you know, those moments when you can be really proud of people. So I, I might have even asked you to, did you write me a recommendation? I, I think I might have. You might have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, it was all like so long ago. Yeah, it was. But while I was there, I uh, I launched an anti-bullying. It was at the time it was an anti-bullying campaign, a White House anti-bullying campaign for Asian American and Pacific Islander youth. And the whole idea was that um, Asian American kids, including Indian American kids, uh, were experiencing bullying um, at very high rates, sometimes at more, twice the national average uh, around the way kids are bullied. And they were being bullied for very specific reasons, for their religion, their immigration status, or their perceived immigration status, for the foods they brought to school, for their accents, or having limited English proficiency, all these things that um, the sort of major anti-bullying campaigns weren't really addressing. 
so we started this as a White House campaign. And then in 2017, when um, Trump was elected and suddenly the White House became very anti-immigrant and very anti-Muslim and very anti really anyone of color, uh, I resigned my post at the commission. It, it actually could have gone on, <clears throat> it actually could have gone for another nine months under the Trump administration, weirdly. Uh, but I resigned my post. We moved Act to Change, which is the name of the, the campaign, outside of the White House, and it's now its own nonprofit. Um, so we've been a nonprofit for just a few years. So we're very young. You know, we went from like having White House funding and White House staff to literally being like me and three other people just trying to keep keep the work alive. But in the last three years, we've we've grown a lot. We now have uh, a ten person working board. It's like amazing. And we have um, we have an advisory council of, of luminaries like uh, Tan France is on our advisory council, and Dr. Vivek Murthy, who is the Surgeon General under Obama, is on our advisory council. Uh, Michelle Lee, who's the editor in chief of Allure Magazine, um, and so many other people. And so when the coronavirus hit, and there was so much anti-Asian, um, I was going to say rhetoric, but honestly, like people were being attacked. Oh yeah, terrible. Um, it was horrible. So we we stepped into a series of webinars, not completely unlike this, and the community outpouring was amazing. You know, we are we did ones with Randall Park from Fresh Off the Boat, and we did a webinar with uh, Jeremy Lin uh, of Lin Sanity fame, the basketball player Jer Jeremy Lin, uh, and then we did a huge event on May 18th called United We Stand, and we brought together celebrities from the full diaspora of the Asian American experience. And again, it was like Tan France and Padma Lakshmi and Daniel Day Kim and Lisa Ling and Cal Penn mm -hmm. and Nacho. And it was such a huge successful event. And I think like, I think the, the video of that event has got gotten like 60,000 views now online. So I feel like we're reaching a big part of the community. So that took up a ton of time and, and, and it's been really meaningful and, and felt really valuable. Um, you That's know, amazing. I wrote a book. What? You know, Yes, wow. I know the book. I wanted to come to the book party that you invited me to, but I was like in previews or something. I couldn't come. But like, what? What's the book? Show us the book. The book. Oh, can you? See it's a gay book. book. Yeah. It, um, it's 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 fictional, but it's very much based on my own experiences. It's about a twelve-year-old Indian American kid who's just beginning to realize that he's gay and kind of his his journey to prove his his self worth and. Um, and it's, I, we, I can't like go into full detail about this because we, um, we haven't announced it yet, but I, we are working on adapting it for television. So I've been wow. writing kind of like furiously during this time, which is, I'm, I'm attached to write the script, which has been, um, it's been really fun, also really hard, but also, but, but really, really fun. And, um, and, you know, Scott, I, you and I were talking about this before, but I feel like such an important part of this time is having the versatility to respond to it. You know, like if, if the new group was like, we're just going to wait, just sit here and wait, it would be such a shame. Uh, and so I've, I've kind of felt the same way. Like I've shifted into working on writing a bunch of stuff and uh, doing some voiceover stuff from home, which has been, which has been nice. And then also focusing on, on the nonprofit. That sounds like a pretty full plate. Yeah. I mean, there was a moment Anything about the book adaptation that it sounds perfect for, for thing. I look forward to my signed copy when you get around to sending it. Right. To me. I'm so embarrassed you don't have one already. I'll send it to you. No, you didn't send me one. Although maybe it's at the office. I haven't been there. You know, you know, like that's, you know, our office is closed or whatever, but, um, uh, uh, but that's amazing that you're adapting that. I don't want you to give away too many details, but what's that, what's that like? Like, are you, are you, um, expanding on it? Are you going deeper because it's your own story? Are you writing it for a specific audience? Like what's, tell, tell us a little bit about it. I'm so curious. So uh, so at the moment we have an amazing production company and it's been optioned by a studio, um, one of the major studios. And I'm only being coy because we we haven't announced it publicly yet. Be coy, just tell us the general details. But we're trying to adapt it. So the book really focuses on a 12 year old kid and his journey, but he has, all these other characters around him, like he's got a best friend and he's got a family. And so we are at the moment we're working on sort of building out the family, which is, it is really interesting to me because I feel like with a book and especially a book for young readers, you can't, um, you can't tell everybody's story. You know, you can only, you have to, you have to pare it down to the story you're telling. And then these other characters exist and, uh, 
And there were so many people in the book that I wanted to give more time to and give them more of a journey. Uh, and so I, so I, the idea is to adapt it into more of a family television show about this whole family mm. and this journey with this kid. And um, so that's been fun, you know, to take like- Oh, you mean it would be like a series and it would be like a TV show and it would be like a series and you could, so you could expand on it and develop characters as you go along. Yes. Not a movie, like a, not, not a TV movie. No, 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 no. yeah. Uh, oh, well, me. that's perfect for something like that. Cause it's you, you could go all the way to this conversation. All the way, all the way. <laughs> but it's it's also like really fun to take like little nuggets, like little little moments I wrote in the book, and be like, oh, like we could totally blow this up into a whole storyline for this person. And uh, I'm working with a co-writer, which has been really great. It's someone I respect and 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 has done a lot of cool work, and so it's fun. But you know, I mean, you know, from the from the theater development process, I'm sure that it's a long. It's a long journey and there's a lot of people. It takes a minute. It does. But that sounds pretty, you know, sometimes if something's relevant, I mean, even in the theater process, like I'll tell you, I had mentioned this other play that we did last year, one and two, um, because the charity of the, uh, uh, tonight is uh, are the lighting designer, uh, and he, you know, that she's amazing. And um, uh, uh, that play I read and I was like, uh, let's do it. You know, so some, because it just felt so ready do you know what i mean yeah. um and sometimes it takes a long time you know because some, sometimes things need to percolate longer so you never know you never know yeah you yeah. never okay. know like do, I thought this sounds moment. perfect like you know this sounds like i would i green light this tomorrow it sounds yeah. so of the moment <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. I, and i do think it's like um i think the the television and film industry in the same way that the theater industry is 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 having this wake up call around um, diversity in storytelling and mm -hmm. and uh, and people who are actually familiar with those stories telling those stories and creating those stories um, it's not only not only do I think it's important and overdue but I also feel like we're finding out that that's what audiences want you know like and, and that there's actually you know money in that because because whatever people watch is what you can can monetize. So um, it does feel like the moment is right. I agree. I think it. I think it would be so amazing. Well, look if they don't, if they don't green light it, we'll make it into a musical or something. All right, done. For, uh, you know what I mean? We, is, like, really, we could, what's that? This is now. This is now. It's now. It's said. It's done. It's out there. So thank you, Scott. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No. No. No doubt. It sounds perfect. That's that. So you've really, you've really been expanding, you know, like, have you, always, have you always written? Is that something that you've always, you know, wanted to do? Or is this something that just came up because you became a celebrity? Or is it something that like you've always had a passion for? Well, a little, I would say a little bit of both. I mean, I've never written. And I, when I first sat down to write a book, I was like, this is so crazy. I'm not a writer. Writing a book is uh, a huge deal, all of which I found to be true. Well, is it your decision to write the book or did somebody say? Say we wanted you to write a book. Someone came at me. So, so I. This is such a like such a crazy story. But in in 2016, when and this feels important considering where we are now. In 2016, when Hillary was running for president, <laughs> a friend of mine who I was like peripherally friends with, like we we've been friends over the years, but she was like she was a friend of an ex boyfriend actually. Uh, she was doing a fundraiser in Denver for Hillary Clinton. And she was like, I want to get a celebrity to come introduce my, she had Tim Kaine's wife speaking at her house. And she was like, will you come out to Denver and introduce Tim Kaine's wife? And I was like, of course. So I went out there and we had lunch that day. And I didn't even know she was doing this, but she had a, um, she has this company called In This Together Media. And their mission is to improve uh, or, or to expand the number of uh, characters of color and girls in books for young people, because much like every other facet of uh, of, of the in, of you know the artistic industry, uh, stories for young people are even though girls tend to read books more than boys at that age, lead characters in books tend to be um, ostensibly straight white boys. And so we sat down together at lunch that day and she was like, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, I don't, I don't think so. And she was like, I feel like you'd have a story to tell. She's Indian American. And we kind of sat down and like talked about ideas. Um, and then I left that lunch and I went home and I started reading a bunch of middle grade novels. And middle grade is just for like readers from eight to 14. I read a bunch of middle grade novels and, and I, like, I was like, yeah, you know what? I think I do have a story that I could tell here. 
And this space feels really interesting to me. Uh, and then, so, so they introduced me to their literary agent. I met with the lit agent in New York and we sat around and we came up with a pitch for a book. And then I like spent a year um, just kind of like writing, like trying to write uh, and stumbled and failed and you know, all of that stuff that, that we all do. And at the end of the year, the lit agent was like, listen, if you really want to sell this book, like now's the time. So send me the pages you have, stop sitting on them, stop doubting. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, and it was, it was amazing. We, we went out to 10 uh, publishing houses uh, five of them ended up bidding on it. Um, I ended up with a, at an imprint at HarperCollins called Balzer and Bray, an amazing editor. Uh, Balzer and Bray did books like uh, the book that became the movie Love, Simon, and the book that became the movie The Hate You Give. And um, I loved my editor. We had an amazing time. And and the book just got it just got a Stonewall honor from the American Library Association. And it's it's winning. Oh. Awards. And yeah, so it's been it's been quite a journey. But uh, but it, but it definitely was something that I think landed on my plate and I just kind of seized the opportunity and, and ran with it. And now writing's become like a thing. It's like, I'm interested in writing another book and hopefully, you know, um, getting this to TV and, and all of that, so. Wow, that's like a big deal. That could take over your whole life. Well, I mean, I hope, <laughs> I hope when we get back to acting that I'll still be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, if we're if we if we could still get if we can get out of the wheelchairs, right? I'm yeah. kidding. I am much more hopeful than that. I'm not. I'm not pessimistic or cynical. I do believe we will. Um, so, speaking of, like, let's talk about your like your last show, uh, Grand Horizons with Lee. How, like, how, like what what was that? Your first Broadway time on Broadway? Uh, no, I I replaced on It's Only a Play. In, oh right, I remember you did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right, right, right. Yeah, which is really fun. So, so it's my second time. It's my second time on Broadway. We we did Grand Horizons at Williamstown Theater Festival before taking. It. Oh, I see. So you did it already. So I kind of knew it a little bit, and but it was but they were right on top of each other. Williamstown, I think, was um, we were there till June or July, and then we uh, started rehearsal for the Broadway production in November. So. Wow, and did you already know what was happening on Broadway or did they see it at Williamstown and oh, so it was already scheduled to happen that way? Yeah, it was a, it was a co-production. Um, oh, I see, and who was the playwright? Uh, Bess Wall. Oh, Bess Wall, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's the one who wrote the play where nobody spoke. Yes. I saw that, yeah, yeah, I saw that. That was good, yeah, yeah. What was that called? Speaking of, Bess, is, Bess, Bess was an actress at Yale Drama. We were- No way. Academy. Uh, and then I think like she tells a story about how I, she got some job and was like, you know what, acting is not for me. <laughs> writer. And now she's got, you know, like she's got plays on Broadway and Small Mouth Sounds, which won a bunch of awards and. Um, so oh, right, Small Mouth Sounds. Yeah, yeah, good for her. Yeah, yeah, I like, I enjoyed that. I didn't see your play on Broadway, alas. You know, we, we get into these crazy schedules. You know, for three years I was a Tony nominator and then I needed a break. So I just sort of stopped going to Broadway shows for a while. <laughs> hell of it. Also, I feel like when you work in the theater, you, it's like impossible to go see theater because you're busy at night with your own show. So um. it is. But then you have friends. You know, I, I probably I, I, I wanted I had every intention of seeing your show. But then, of course, I didn't. So but so what was so so the, but this was the first time you didn't replace on Broadway. It was something that you had done already at Williamstown and you knew what had you signed up for both ahead of time or or you or you. Uh, no, I had stuck your toe in and then decided, or um, you know, I mean, I think it was like one of those theater things where everyone kind of commits, but you don't know what's going to really happen. Like you're, you, you hope everything's going to stay intact. And um, but Lee, Lee is amazing. Did you have you guys worked together before? Yeah, she did our fabulous production of Sweet Charity, one of my favorite things with Sutton Foster. Did you see that? I uh, know I didn't see. Oh that. my god, that was incredible. But it was amazing. That was incredible. Yeah. yeah. And she did an incredible job. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. I loved it. She is like whip smart and so fun. We actually, you know how Williamstown, everyone kind of lives in apartments together. And so Lee and I were actually roommates. <laughs> and, oh my gosh. Right. How funny. I know. So funny. I mean, so weird. I imagine she would be fun to be a roommate with. Oh my God. The it was so fun. And she was so nice. She'd, she'd come home from the grocery store and be like, I furnished the whole fridge for us. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> she has that mama spirit. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but it was yeah. Really fun. It was a great cast. It was. It was Ashley. It was it the same cast, Williamstown and um, New York. It was. It was not. It was not the same cast. There was. Um, there was a nuclear family at the heart of the show, and the entire nuclear family ended up being different. So, oh. which was kind of a. In terms of like, if if the cast is going to change, I think it was kind of good that. Uh, you know, the whole family kind of changed together. Mm. Was that an economical decision? You know, you I don't, don't know. I know. Well, I know that one piece of it was Jesse Tyler Ferguson did it at Lois Town. He had to oh, yeah. Family. So Michael oh, yeah. He's there. amazing. He's so good. Yeah. And Michael and he were so different. And my. Oh, I, Michael Yuri. Yeah. Michael Yuri. Oh, right. He's, yeah. What a great cast. All yeah. the great gays in one show. Great gays. And we had a gay uh, sex scene. In the show, and um, you know that's you like you did a gay sex scene, like naked or like under the covers. Uh, I was in my underwear. Underwear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was there an intimacy coach? You know, we did not have an. <laughs> and I back and I'm like, I feel like I mean, I feel like you're supposed to have that, but but both Michael and Jesse and I knew each other way before we did the show, and we felt very comfortable. With it. And I think. I think if we had asked for an NPC coach, it would have been a, a no. Of course. Yeah, yeah. No, those guys are great. They're such free. They're free actors like you. What a great cast. Mm -hmm. you know, so, the, yeah, the, so was it a gay theme play? Or it just... Uh, no, not at all. Not at all. Oh, you just had a, a hot gay sex scene for the Broadway audiences? Yeah, yeah. Just a show. Got it. Smart writer, that best. I got I to gotta call her. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'm so glad you had a good experience on that. So, um, well, we have like a couple more minutes just to sort of um, wrap this part of the the evening up. Um, what do you, what do you what do you what are your hopes now? Like, what wh wh where's your head? Like, we, you know, I know that you know you're you're happily married and and uh, you you know so you have a wonderful life, which is so great because it's so I feel most pain most of the pain from my friends who are by themselves. So I. You know, that's the, that's always the, my, you know, I spend a lot of time with my friends who, you know, are bearing this alone, which I can't imagine, but I, but being, you know, being married and being with somebody does make it a little bit easier. And, uh, and he's a caterer and he's doing his catering thing. Yeah. yeah. Tell, say, tell, give him a plug. Tell, tell a little bit about his company because yeah. he's back up. Well, you know, I mean, what's, what's been kind of nice in terms of supporting each other through this time is that both of our industries have taken such a big a big hit um but he's like all of us has found ways to survive through that so he so ryan corbea is my husband and he uh he owns a catering company called dish food and events uh they're based out say of say it again because you broke up a tiny bit it's such a good they're company they're called dish food and events um and they're they're based out of brooklyn they've been around for about 10 years now and you know, like he, he, like many of the other catering companies, when COVID hit, um, he he started doing free meals for healthcare workers, and he raised uh, tens of thousands of dollars to send send free meals to healthcare workers in in New York City and um, even on, out on Long Island. Uh, you know, he dealt with all the things that I'm sure you dealt with. You know, with having to get government assistance and furloughing people and and trying to keep people on payroll and and but they're starting to come back. Like they're they're he's actually. I'm doing uh, two tastings today for weddings that will hopefully happen in the next few months. And, you know, little smaller events are coming back in New York and uh, hopefully at some point corporate will come back. And, um, but we, you know, I feel really lucky, Scott. And I, I think like in this time of isolation and uh, being quarantined, I'm so grateful that I had someone to do it with who I really love. We've been together for 16 years. So, um, but also someone who, loves to cook because <laughs> <laughs> that's the best i was so jealous when i was thinking of that just now i'm glad you said that i didn't want to i oh didn't want to make it too much too light of it but to like be like in quarantine with a caterer can you imagine what a dream you you got uh, lucky you got a you got a you got a tv deal and your husband's a caterer I know, I feel like you know it's just the most amazing life yeah. um anyway anybody who wants to ask malik any questions or anything like that we're having our cocktail hour now you can go on our website. Uh, I think that's a, you can join, uh, costs a little money, but it goes to the new group. It's a good cause. Uh, and um, yeah, and next week, uh, our conversation is gonna be with the great director, Erica Schmidt, who directed our production of Cyrano uh, this, oh, there she is, hi Erica, who directed our production of Cyrano with Peter Dinklage uh, and Jasmine Safis-Jones this 
year was amazing. Music by The National, amazing show. Book by Erica, loved it. And so next week we have Erica. And I'll see you in five minutes, Malik. We will meet again in a Zoom cocktail hour with some lucky people. All right. Thanks. Okay, see you soon. Bye.